today. My name is Christy Wells, and you are watching the Between the Leaves broadcast. I'm pleased to introduce you to several of our professional genealogists on staff here at Ancestry.com. You've got Amy Crow, you've got Ann Mitchell Gillespie, and Juliana Zook Smith with us, as well as Krista Cowan. And today's question, we're asking them all to tell us how they all got started in family history. Amy, would you mind taking this and kicking off the discussion? Sure. Um, you know, when, when people ask me, you know, how long I've been doing genealogy, and my answer is I've been doing this pretty much all my life. I'm hoping that I can actually share my screen here. We'll see if this works. Because um, I, I found this picture. This is from about 1970. And it's, it's in a family cemetery down in Lawrence County, Ohio. And that's me right there, little toddler, uh, running around the cemetery. So I've been doing this a, a long time. That's my mom. That's my grandma. That's my grandpa. And grandma really is the one who got me started. Um, when I was, you know, in grade school in... I don't know, it was either grade school or junior high, I forget, whenever it was the roots came out. Um, you know, like a lot of people, I talked to my grandma and was getting, you know, stories from her and whatnot, and she was a great genealogist. She would, she would not have called herself that, but she really was a, a family historian. She labeled her photographs. She actually wrote a couple of notebooks of her own memories of, of growing up. Uh, the Great Flood of 1913 and how they barely got out of the house before the flood, you know, literally swept their house off of the foundation. Uh, really glad they did that. Um, so really talking with Grandma, she's the one who really got me interested in the family stories and really kind of sparked that interest of, you know, let's, let's record this. Let's learn more of the stories about these people. Ironically, it's my other grandma, my maternal grandmother, who really inspired me to really start doing research because she died when my mom was just eight. So my mom grew up not knowing a lot about that side of her family. So, you know, after I started having kids, and I, I think that's kind of one of those triggers for people that, you know, they start having kids and they start feeling more of a part of a, a longer timeline. I know that's what happened with me is that it was really that need to learn more, you know, how, how much further back does this tree go? And so while it was my paternal grandmother who got me going with the stories and got me going with the photographs and everything, it's really my maternal grandmother who sparked really that first research you know, of really digging into records because I wanted to identify these people because we, we didn't even know who they were. My mom knew her grandparents, but that was it. I mean, she knew the aunts and uncles, but she didn't really know anything further back, didn't know where they came from, didn't know any of their stories because there was that, that connection that, that was broken when her mother died. So really got it from, from both of my grandmas. That's pretty much my story. And what about you? Um, for me, I haven't been in it, I think, as long as the rest of you guys, because I'm pretty sure most of you guys, at least Chris and Julie, can't have out of the womb doing genealogy. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, I can remember, and maybe you guys can identify the version. My dad used to have this DOS version of FTM. It was this horrible blue one at Family Tree Maker. Do you remember that? Um. <laughs> And he gave me a copy, and I would play around with it. And I always thought it was really interesting. And years later, um, I happened to pick up a copy of Family Tree Maker at uh, Fry's. That's a tech store out here in California. And I downloaded it, and I started playing with it. And I was talking to my dad, which was great. It's one of the few things we could talk about without arguing. And so, and then I was started digging into the family. And I don't know if you guys remember the... Um, the article I wrote about the Brady Bunch family, the guy who had 12 children and married the wife, I think, with 10 children. Well, I started finding all of these trees online, and none of them were complete, and all of them had people married to the wrong women, et cetera, et cetera. And I remember sitting on the floor with little note cards of each person trying to figure out who was who and everything, and it was at that point I knew I 
was absolutely gone. It's the puzzle piece of it, right? You just start digging in, and then you know. Then I started doing um, my grandmother's side, and all these people that I had never heard of. I mean, it was just fascinating. And I, I have no contact with my mother's side of the family. For so for me, finding those people and discovering that it's like this whole part of my family I knew nothing about. And for me, that's just been wonderful, right? I feel this connection where I didn't have one. So for me, it's something that I'm just obsessed with. It's just making that connection. Krista? Well, I didn't come out of the womb doing genealogy. <laughs> I don't know. I just assumed you had. <laughs> but pretty close. <laughs> when my parents were in college, uh, they used to spend one Friday a month up at the Family History Library in Salt Lake City. And uh, I was born during that time, and they would take me in my baby carrier, and they would shove me under a microfilm reader and leave me there all day. <laughs> so I was pretty close. Cool. That me as a three-year-old in the cemetery. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so pretty close. Now, I, kind of like Amy, I grew up, um, you know, surrounded by family and family stories and a grandma who shared pictures and stories, and I remember going to family reunions as a child. Lots of, um, just there was always lots of family around and lots of stories to be told. But uh, I didn't get really involved in family history until I was about, like personally, until I was about 12 years old. Um, that year, my parents sent me to computer camp. And I remember being so upset about that because I wanted to go to dance camp. Um, <laughs> I was livid with them for a while. Um, they sent me to this computer camp where I learned things like, you know, how to program in C. That was exciting. Um, and when I got home... My dad had this old computer, uh, well, it was brand new at the time, but it was like a Compaq 64 or something, yeah. right? And wow. uh, he had one of the very first versions of PATH, the DOS-based version of PATH, installed on this computer, and he handed me a bunch of old files that his aunt had given him, and then my mom had a book that one of her cousins had written about our family history, um, and they handed me that, and they said, okay, you know how to use this thing. We need you to computerize all of this. <laughs> and I, I remember thinking, oh, great. That's why you sent me to computer camp. <laughs> <laughs> so clear. Um, yeah. And it took me about six years. I mean, obviously, I was a teenager and had other things going on in my life. But um, over the course of the next, you know, five or six years until I graduated from high school, um, I would keep going back to those files, and I'd keep computerizing stuff. And of course, every time I did, you, I mean, you guys know this. Every time you enter a new piece of information, a new name, a new date, a new place, you, you have this craving to know more. And of course, um, I wasn't always in a position to have some of the instant satisfaction to some of those questions like we do now. Now, but I remember writing lists of questions and then you know every once in a while like my dad and I would um, I grew up in California and Oregon and every once in a while we'd come out to Utah and we'd go to the family history library and we'd take my list of questions and I remember doing that several times as a teenager um, and it was something that my dad and I could do together which was really important because we didn't have we didn't have much else in common um, and so it was a time for us to spend digging into our family history and learning more um, and then when I got into college, I just kind of took it on myself to take those computer files and, and run with it, and I, I think I haven't stopped running. <laughs> <laughs> Julie, what about you? Uh, well, again, like, not quite out of the womb, but pretty early <laughs> I started. My mom was as a well-known genealogist, and she started back in the 70s because she never knew her father. So she began trying to, she was trying to fill out our baby books really, the family trees that come in the little baby books when you're first born. And she never knew her father because he came ill when she was very young. She grew up in Texas away from her family. So there was a disconnect for her. And she wanted to kind of fill that in. So she, she reached out to an aunt, her Aunt Olive, and they started corresponding. And I can still remember the day that she first got a letter from Aunt Olive. And she just was holding this letter that had these details about her family that she never knew and she was crying and I was like wow that is some powerful stuff <laughs> so I, I that was like one of probably my first memory of family history and then she eventually moved on and got a little more hardcore she started taking some classes uh, eventually we wound up when I was about 12 years old we had a microfilm reader in the basement so we were really hardcore <laughs> <laughs> and she would she was looking for people in the census in Brooklyn <laughs> and back then it was all on microfilm it was all unindexed 
So she would rent these microfilms from a local family history center, and she would bring them home, and she'd go through them, and then she would pay my sisters and I to go through them, and we've got a quarter name every time we found someone with our surname. And you had to fill out an index card with the source <laughs> and the page number, and, you had, and if you didn't do it right, you didn't get your quarter either. <laughs> So there was quality control there. There was some quality control. You didn't write down where you found this. Now I have to go through the whole roll again. You don't get a quarter. <laughs> so, but it was finding those, and it, it was when you found something back then. The thing that was really kind of neat was, you know, you savored it. You were like, oh my gosh, this is them. And you look, you poured over every column, and you know, I think now we kind of get to this point where we just kind of. It's so easy to attach things to our tree that we don't have that savoring and that appreciation. But that was what really hooked me, I think, was, you know, the thrill of finding them and having my mom go, yeah, that's them, you know, and you're, you were reaching back in time. So that was a really a big deal for me. And then through the years, I've just always kind of kept on. And I remember my mom taking, taping my grandparents my, on my dad's side when they would come to visit at Easter and at Thanksgiving and for the stories that my grandma would tell us. So it was just really a cool experience and that that instilled in me the, the love of the stories and the family and just the discovery that just finding something on a microfilm was such a thrill for me, it, even at that young age. So I was, I was hooked early, early on. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Julie, you mentioned those Brooklyn censuses. If I remember correctly, you were looking for Kellys, weren't you? Uh, we weren't looking for Kellys at that point. It was mostly Millers. Um, oh, that's so much better. Really unusual surname. Yeah. yeah. Uh, One or two. Ovens. Yeah. The Kellys came as we progressed a little further back. <laughs> So, so when you start talking about some of those really common surnames, right? I, I know we all have them, and we get we hit those that frustration sometimes. Are there other? Is there other frustration points or other times any of you have ever just wanted to just give up or you know throw oh, in throw your hands up in the air? Or, like, how do you get through that? How do you? Well, you switch you families. That? You just go to another one for a while. <laughs> yeah, you you do. I mean, you know, growing up with a maiden name of Johnson. You know, really? Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, seriously, I, I have the Johnson line going back to, um, well, he's he's in Morgan County, Ohio by 1834, and get a load his name is John Johnson. Of course out of, it is. Out, out of Upper Canada. What else could yeah. it be? Yeah, I mean, you know, and I told my dad, sorry, that line doesn't go any further back. You know, I just I'm done with that one. Yeah, I'm I'm done I'm done with the Johnson line. You know, I'm I'm good. I've got them coming out of Canada. I have them in Ohio. I have naturalization. I you know, I'm I'm good. Um there there are just there, there are too many other ancestors that I can focus on now. I'm sure that at some point in time I'm going to get really, really curious because I want to know more about John's wife Eunice, who I don't have a maiden name for yet. But right now, uh, no. But I, I don't feel, I don't feel guilty or anything, not working on the Johnsons because I mean there, there are more families than, than just that one. Uh, well, I always seem to be drawn back to the Kellys and the Miller, <laughs> the challenges. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe well, I'm a glutton for punishment. <laughs> don't you? Do you have favorite ancestors? Ones that you just love to research? Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I have a lot of like, like I have this, I think he's a fourth grade grandfather, and he deeded two of his grandchildren a pony, and he was always doing nice things for people, and I just, I, uh, I'm totally obsessed with him, totally obsessed with him, and it's just, some of them just reach out, I, it's, they reach out to you through time, don't you think? Yeah. You just feel yeah. them, you have to do them. Yeah, the Kellys are in Manhattan, and they were this, I finally tied them together because they were all, they all made artificial flowers, and that kind of brought the family together. They all, they were named James, and James, and Catherine, and Mary, and James. <laughs> <laughs> because, but, because the Irish they, only have four first names. They yeah. really do. Yeah. Jane, too. There was five. No. <laughs> <laughs> but they were they were just a, for some reason when I was able to tie them together with that occupation they fascinated me and I knew from um, a family story that they had been really involved in the church and that then we found out that they had actually donated property in Upper Manhattan I'm like how did these people making artificial flowers get all this money 
<laughs> and it turned out we started. I wanted to look for land records of them donating the property, and what I found was all these lists of them buying property from the city of Manhattan, or New York, and reselling it. So they started out in artificial flowers, but moved quickly into real estate. Yeah. <laughs> but they've always <laughs> fascinated me, and it, it just the whole you know thing and none of it ever you know it all well, most of it went to the church and none of it ever came down they all daughtered out I didn't get any of it Lord knows. <laughs> but it's just I think their story is just so cool on how they came in the 1820s and built this little business and then suddenly you know they were doing really well so I just think it's kind of cool American dream <laughs> that is cool that is I, I think my favorite ancestor if I had to pick one would have to be Matilda de Bold Skinner Cross and Brown McFellan. Oh, her name is the best. <laughs> the best. You know, I mean, every time I find her, she's identified with some other husband. The thing is, I'm not sure that McFellan was her last husband, so I have no idea what her name was when she died. Wow. Um, I don't know when she died. I don't know where she died. Her first husband, the one that I descend from, William Skinner. Anybody out there who descends from William Harrison Skinner of Perry County, Ohio? Um, <laughs> well, they, they, I mean, the Twitter handle is at the bottom of her screen. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Tweet us, please. Yeah. I mean, seriously, I, I, I will occasionally throw out uh, real life examples, you know, from, from my own tree when I'm lecturing, and I'm convinced that one of these days it will work for me. Um, but Matilda. She just, I, I call her the Mary Widow because every time I find her, she's married to somebody else or widowed from somebody else, and I can't kill all of her husbands off. I can only get rid of the husband. <laughs> <laughs> she may not have divorced or killed all of them off. But that, that's what I'm wondering. I mean, what, what's happening to all these husbands? And Don't assume you know the answers, rule number I one. I don't know the answers yet. So, she's my favorite. She intrigues me. Krista, who is your favorite ancestor? My favorite ancestor? I'm just curious. Yeah, it's a great, great grandmother. And the reason she's my favorite is because she was the brick wall that I worked on through most of high school. And I actually, um, we knew who she married. We had her marriage certificate. Of course, she fathered her had sons uh, with her husband. Her husband took off on her, left to go out to Hollywood um, in the 19, early 1900s. And uh, so she raised these two boys by herself, which in and of itself was a big deal at the time. And uh, she was a dressmaker. I mean, I, I knew all this stuff about her, right? Um, she, when her sons were grown, her oldest son actually did the same thing to his wife and children that his father had done four little girls and he just decided he was done and moved out to California to be with his dad and um, so she told her daughter uh, her daughter-in-law in a very um, biblical situation where um, she said you know what I will take you back home to, to Louisiana to be with your family and to raise your daughters and I will come with you and help you raise them and wow. so she did she went she moved to New Orleans and this is a woman who had been born and raised and lived in Ohio her whole life um, moved to New Orleans with her daughter-in-law and these little granddaughters and she helped raise them and she worked she worked her whole life to help raise these little girls but because of that um, my grandfather who was a child of her other son never knew his own grandmother he met her twice his whole life um, and so I, you know I, I had these these images of her and these stories of her and one or two pictures but I didn't know who her parents were I knew nothing before her marriage and so for years and years that was the mystery my dad and I tried to solve and it was two weeks after I came to work here at Ancestry um, that I found in our family and local history collection I found a book written about the county in Ohio where she came from that listed the names of her parents and it listed her with her husband so that I knew that it was the same person um, right. and because of that I was able to just break through that brick wall and not only did it come tumbling down the ancestors came rushing at me <laughs> hundreds <That's> of awesome. them. <laughs> that, th there's so many things about that story that are awesome I think it's interesting too in that story is how generations how bad and good behavior um, 
tends to repeat itself. You yeah. tend to see patterns of that. Even if it's in terms of people dying young and then remarrying or, you know, doing things where they desert people. I mean, we all have families like that. And it's just interesting to see how they do that time after time. It's And it's those particular stories, though, those inspirational stories that just make you feel so good about yourself. Because you're like, if I come from these people, yeah. I must be okay. Well, and yeah. even, even when their their histories are not so great, to come to understand that helps you understand sometimes your own weaknesses or the weaknesses of your parents and recognize the things you've overcome. Right. And the, the Yeah, I think it's great. And a, kind of a, a subplot or a, a postscript to that particular story, um, because this uh, daughter-in-law that lived in New Orleans had, had four girls, all daughters, and my grandfather knew the names of his cousins and their birth dates, but he lost track of them after his grandmother died, and so he didn't know who any of them married. And so I have spent a lot of my adult life looking for these four daughters, and finally um, got a Google alert on an obituary for one of them about three years ago. It turns out she had a huge family, and I was able to connect with them on Facebook, and then I took my dad to New Orleans two years ago for Mother's Day, and we were able to meet them and have this lovely reunion um, where my dad was able to meet these second cousins of his that we didn't even know existed before three years ago. That is wonderful. And they had, of course, more stories and more pictures and more information about this great-grandmother. So. <laughs> That's a great story. No, I, I find the same thing. I draw a lot of strength from some of the stories I found. I've got a, a family of famine immigrants where the parents came over in 1844 and they left their children ages 2, 4, and 6 in Ireland. Well, the famine hits then. Their kids are still in Ireland, presumably with family, and they came over in 1849 on a famine ship. They were 7, 9, and 11. My great-grandmother was the 7-year-old. But her brother is listed as a laborer at age 11. And it looks like there's people from the same town. I really want to research this passenger list because I'm pretty <laughs> sure they're all from the same place. There's a lot of witness names and sponsors, a lot of connections that I want to put together. But that story, I mean, of that family, it just, it, no matter how bad things get, <laughs> it isn't that bad. <laughs> so it puts things in perspective. It really does. It really yeah, does. And, and I, I think that the more that we learn about our ancestors and we see what they have gone through and we see both where they have persevered and where they have kind of, you know, not done so great, um, I think that that, at least for me, it helps me think that, okay, we can be pretty negative about our society today, but is our society today really that much different than what our ancestors? I mean, you look at, you know, newspaper accounts, you know, back in the late 1800s, early 1900s. I mean, you talk about yellow journalism. I mean, they made absolutely no bones about which political candidates they were behind. And, you know, if, if your family was Republican, they may not have an obituary in the Democrat newspaper. Right. You know, I mean, they, you know, they were really that divided. It was that obvious. So I think in, in some ways learning about our ancestors and really studying them really kind of helps us put things, you know, sort of in, into perspective today. It's, you know, history really does repeat itself. Yeah, very well said. I appreciate that because yeah. yeah, I find some of those same patterns, um, some of those same, you know, I mean, horrible things have always happened in the world and yes. you know, there have always been hard times, there have always been, you know, and maybe our challenges are a little bit different or the, the face on them is a little bit different, but, um, but, but there's still challenges and there's still hard things happening in the world, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, another it's, thing that you have... Go ahead. No, go, go, go ahead, Amy. I was going to say, I think another thing that you have to do is when you look at what was going on in the past, I'm a southerner, I mean, if you've read any of my columns, you know this, <laughs> and, um, like, I have ancestors who were slave owners, which, of course, is just, you know, gives me the heebie-jeebies, but you also have to go back and judge your ancestors in the time where they lived. I definitely don't approve of everything every one of my ancestors has done. It's like, really? 
but you do have to go, okay, the people who lived in that time and did this, this is why they believe the things that they did. And I think sometimes those things are hard to come to terms with, and we do try and sweep some things that make us uncomfortable under the rug, right? Mm -hmm. But you really do have to dig out their stories, whether they're good and bad, and just tell them. Because I think even if they're bad, sometimes those stories can even be inspirational. Yeah. Without the bad, it's incomplete. You're right. You're not getting the full story. And a lot of times, too, I've got one ancestor, and we thought, oh, we, he was found dead on a pile of bricks. And we didn't know what it was about until we found this newspaper article and said he had lost his hat company in a fire, and he had lately been dissolute. <laughs> so he'd been drinking a little. And they assumed that he just fell down, hit his hat, and died. But when you look at it in the context, he had lost his, his wife to tuberculosis, um, with leaving him with a two and a three year old. Um, he lost his business, as it said in the article. Um, he had had a pretty rough run of things in the years leading up to it. So, you know, you kind of put it all in perspective. Right. And I, it can be hard. So what's the one thing you wish you had known when you first got started, even you, Krista, laying underneath the microfilm machine? <laughs> what's the one thing you wish you had known when you first got started that would have made your life easier now? So I think for me, it, um, it comes back to source citations, uh, which yes. sound, like which sounds boring even coming out of my mouth. But um, I, I just wish I had known enough to record where the information I got came from, because I find myself now in the position of retracing a lot of those steps just to document what I have. And and in at least one case in my family, I had to lop off an entire branch of my tree because I, you know, an incorrect connection had been made by other family members and I had accepted that as truth without, truth without proof, not really truth. <laughs> truth without proof is not really proof. I think that should be a mantra. <laughs> I like Definitely. that. For me, it's the same thing. I have this one piece of information. It's about the death of a baby, which is probably why this couple got married. And I know I saw it and I can't find the information and it's really critical to their story and it makes me crazy if you don't write things down you will live to regret it yeah I, I had that ex well I don't want to say that exact same thing but I had something similar happen just this morning I was I was looking at this ancestor that I had identified him pretty easily early on when I was you know just starting out in genealogy and it's one of those deals where with genealogy, your skills hopefully keep developing. And the, the bad thing is that our good research skills, as we're developing them, they get used on the, re on the ancestors that we're just now finding, the ones that we're just now looking for. You know, we need to go back and revisit those ancestors that we identified when we were just budding genealogists and we didn't really know a whole lot. And I was looking at one of those ancestors this morning, and honestly, I have this marriage bond. I have no idea what county it came from. It identifies the bride's father, which is great. It's awesome. But I have no idea where this came from. I think it's from somewhere in Virginia, maybe, possibly. <laughs> um, yeah, so if you're researching Hibbs in Monongahela County, Virginia, now West Virginia, let me know. Uh, Twitter, at Amy Crow. Uh, <laughs> but I, I don't know where this record came from. And I, it's a photocopy, but I didn't take the time to write down where I found it, you know, what microfilm, what website, you know, what it is. So I now I have to go back and retrace those steps, and that's, that's really frustrating that I have the record, but it's not doing me a whole lot of good. One of the things that I learned the hard way when I and especially working with Kelly's and Miller's and the common surnames is I was always tempted to kind of well you know I really just am focusing on the James while I'm in this you know microfilm I'm just gonna get the Jameses and then you figure out well I really should be focusing on their whole family so yeah you got to go back to that microfilm and get everybody and for years my mom told me make sure you catch the Kelly's with the EY at the end too and I was like, you know, that's a lot of writing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, right. 
And so I just said, no, they always spelled their name with a Y. <laughs> and I only got them. Well, guess what? I found them with an EY now. <laughs> so I've got to go. There's an I want out them. there, too. <laughs> yeah, so, and I probably should start looking at the O. Kellys as well. <laughs> <laughs> so do a thorough search at the beginning would be my big piece of advice. So you don't have to keep revisiting that same microphone or that same collection to get the same thing you were looking for. Just grab it all at once. You're playing with a full deck at the beginning. It's good to play with a full deck. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Although some of us may have been accused with not playing with one all the time. <laughs> I know I have, yes. <laughs> yep, same here. All right. Well, it has been fun talking to you guys. Yes. Yes. This and I believe this has been Between the Leaves. And this has been Anne, Amy, Krista and Julie. We'll see you next time. Thanks. Bye-bye.